today's talk, uh, first of all, is going to be quite unusual for, from many points of view, you will see. Uh, and is, in a sense, the opposite of uh, yesterday's talk. I mean, yesterday I gave precise statements. I could rigorously prove whatever I was saying. I could answer questions. Uh, today is going to be not many answers, but mostly questions by myself. So, and not statements, but rather hints. But eventually we're going to go into physics. But here also I ask you not to think about uh, most of the physics you are specialized on, but go back to the basics. So basic principles. What we're going to discuss is already in the title, and this is already a question mark, it's not an answer, this is something that we have to find. So it's more or less uh, a project and a few hints for a project that can be developed based on, let's call them, first principles, so to say. Uh, the only thing we have to do is to think quantum mechanically, if you allow me the adverb. Um, when I started my research, I started with the foundations of quantum mechanics, and the first thing I was taught was never think classically. Because if you try to do quantum mechanics thinking classically, you're going to get wrong results. You're not going to get, you're not going to understand what's going on. So what we're going to do, we're going to, in this talk, we're going to merge ourselves into quantum mechanics. We're going to think that way. And what we want to talk about, I'm saying what we want to talk about, because as I say here, I want to stimulate a discussion. I don't mean that the discussion has to be done today. What I would hope is that this is going to be an ongoing discussion, maybe for months, who knows. But I want to stimulate some thinkings, some thoughts. About what? About the nature of space-time. Of course, I will talk about the magic star a little bit. I mean, that's why there was this, that old talk yesterday on the uh, mathematical aspects of the magic star, and I tried to show you how that may inspire a new way to go beyond the current, the current uh, knowledge of fundamental physics. Uh, a little bit of history. Uh, again, we are, now we are thinking about E8 because that's going to be uh, the tool that we are using. Could be other things. Uh, what I would like it to be is an algebra. I insist on that, and I was insisting on the algebraic aspect of what I was saying also yesterday. So I would like it to be an algebra, but could be any algebra. What we like, when I say we, I mean Mike, Alessio, and myself, is E8 and its extension to exceptional periodicity, which is the creature of Mike, right? which, which we like too, we are together with Alessio. But in any case, it's to be an algebra, for the reasons I will tell you about. If you think about E8, historically, um, a8 is an exceptionally algebra, and the exceptionally algebras had a pioneer as a physicist working on them. And this, is, and this was Feza Gursay. Uh, we are back in the late 70s. Uh, he noticed that the unusual nature of the quark degrees of freedom uh, has been a strong incentive for the construction of new, sorry, Cle, maybe you'll see from there, a new quantum mechanical model, a new quantum mechanical models in which uh, these strange properties of the quarks think that we were in the late 70s are to appear naturally and not as a dark artifacts. And what he noticed is a well-known fact algebraically about uh, uh, the octonions is that if you think of the derivations of the octonion or the automorphism group in terms of a group. Uh, of the octonions G2, if you specialize one imaginary unit of the octonions, uh, you get a rationale for uh, SU3, and thinking of the strange properties of octonion, first of all, non-associativity, uh, Gursey uh, was looking at that SU3 as an SU3 color. Uh, 
nowadays uh, call that we all know. I don't know. Call Fury. Fury. Call Fury. And I think, did, we, he, did he come here to GR? Yeah, uh, hasn't come here, but we've dialogued a bit. You, you did, I think. Yeah, bit, sure. Yeah. So she, she's taking uh, the we, same idea from, from, from Guse. Yeah. Say, we, uh, say. Mia Hughes, you know her. Right? Yes, sure. Yeah, she so was here. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. She's also very nice and brilliant. Um, both, both of them are yeah. Yeah, very nice. And actually, she's basing her work nowadays on the work of Gursé, now, as she admits. I mean, she writes in, a, in her paper. She acknowledges Gursé for pioneering uh, this algebraic aspects and the relationship uh, with the particle physics somehow with this issue three through colors. Let's see what we can do with the magic star. The magic star is a much richer structure because we not only have the octonions, I think that one octonion would be one entry of one Jordan algebra inside the magic star. So E8 is much more than that. First of all, it has three families very naturally. Uh, and then there is a, a much richer structure. There is a, a six in the center of the magic star. There is a huge group. A, a, a huge algebra, let's say, the level of the algebra. So as I said yesterday, I remind you, if, but now we want to look at them from a physical point of view. Again, this is not rigorous, but I mean, it's just evoking something. Uh, you remember we were talking yesterday in the lesson you did too, uh, about these four orthogonal uh, SU3s, the, the, the complex form would be uh, the A2, these four A2s, you can associate one easily to color. This was also in the picture that I showed, the first picture I showed of the magic star. They were all colored with gluons, because you think of uh, the generators of that SU3 or A2, same thing, it's the complex form, as I said, uh, as the gluons. Uh, you have an orthogonal one that you can easily uh, uh, look at as a, a flavor SU3. Uh, Gursa himself, at the time was thinking about a flavor SU3, not an SU1 cross, uh, an SU2 cross U1. And then you have two more that you naturally associate somehow to gravity. I would rather say that they're associated to dark matter for the reasons I will tell you about. Um, in any case, you have a huge structure which includes uh, algebras that are related as, have, have always been related to particle physics. So you try to interpret them in this way. Uh, okay. Uh, this is, okay, the, comp this is the, the composition uh, we showed you uh, yesterday, where you have uh, the three Jordan pairs of uh, uh, exceptional Jordan algebras which would be this ones in this plane, and then there are other three inside E6, which is in the middle. You may think of them as quark, uh, colored matter, let's say, because this is going to involve both fermions and bosons. We will talk about that. And you may think of these other uh, Jordan algebras over the complex, which are inside E6, which, are, which appear in the center in this picture, uh, as leptons, so to say. Uh, and as I, this is this I already said. So, why an algebra? Well, the aim is to think of this algebra as a vertex operator algebra, simply meaning that the algebra represents the interactions. I mean, after all, you you need to have in physics an interaction in which two particles produce a new particle. You must create things. And this is what naturally an algebra does via the multiplication in the algebra. You get two incoming objects and you get an outcome. Uh, if you think in terms of, of space-time, which is our target, uh, as we all know very well, the incompatibility of quantum mechanics and general relativity at small scales make it impossible to stay to test if space-time is a continuum. You know, you have to put so much energy to get that resolution that you create a black hole and you destroy any information about the space you're trying to test, the space properties you're trying to test. So the fact that the space-time is 
normally assumed to be a continuum is just a working hypothesis. Nobody <coughs> can tell that space-time is continuous. Actually, in the case, in the model <coughs> I'm going to present you, we are thinking of a discrete space-time. Uh, I invite you to think in terms of the Occam's razor, namely, you have, as I already said before, uh, tried to get rid of most of the structures uh, all of us is specialized on and, and go back to first principles. So try to, 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 to put everything away except for, for very fundamental uh, things. And I like to report a sentence in this respect by Wheeler. I was so lucky to hear him saying that. We were at the breakfast in, in, uh, near Washington at the conference. Uh, and is reported in, in books and papers of him. This is a famous sentence. It's very frequently reported by, by Wheeler, where he says, it is my opinion that everything must be based on a simple idea. And it is my opinion that this idea, once we have finally discovered it, will be so compelling, so beautiful, that we will say to one another, yes, how could it have been any different? So we're, th that's... That, that sentence I put together with the Occam's razors, because this is the principle. So let's try to get rid of the overstructure. So I don't want to think in terms, for instance, of supersymmetries, uh, string theory. I won't even touch, also because I don't know it, so I'm, I'm very ignorant, and theory, or this type of things. Uh, uh, in the future talks by Davis and, and Mike, those things will come in, but what I'm um, trying to tell you is to let's start from very simple basic ideas okay, and see what happens. Then we can develop, of course. We can get to those theories. But we want to avoid thinking in terms of those for the moment. So the basic principle that I'm thinking of, one of the basic principles, is there is no way of defining space-time without a preliminary notion or concept of interaction. In other words, the universe of non-interacting particles has no space-time. There is no physical quantity that can relate one particle to the other. So imagine a set of particles that do not interact. They don't feel any change, so they don't feel any time. If nothing changes, there is no time going on. If they do not interact, they cannot measure the distance from one particle to the other. After all, what is space-time? If you think in terms of what you measure, which, which what a physicist should think about, you must be able to measure whatever concept you introduce in physics, in principle at least. How can you measure a distance if you do not interact? So that's why I'm saying, and that's very obvious, I think we all agree, and it's a very basic principle. If you have a set of particles that do not interact, there is no possible space-time. No possible definition of space-time. So that's why I insist on the fact that interactions are the objects we have to focus on first of all, before anything else, before space-time. Yeah, I commented. Yes, sure. I don't want to agree completely with it. The concept of particles, three particles. The three particles. Yeah, I think they are concept of. Uh, we have to start from that. So interact without the concept of particles. Yeah, yeah. sure. Th that's going to be what, what I'm. But do you agree that uh, whatever a particle is, you know, when you have an algebra, you know, what do you have? You have objects. Yeah. You need to say what they are. Yeah. You have objects. And what makes an algebra is the relationships between objects. That's the important thing. You can do an algebra with knives and forks. I think Heisenberg used to say that. Who cares what the objects are? The important thing is the relationships that are between those objects, or among those objects. Even if they're okay. discretized quanta of a quantum field theory, there would yeah. be interactions, relationships. But, but, so you have to start from something and start from so it's exactly my argument. 
you have to start from something and say, what is the relationships among those? And in terms of an algebra, what is the multiplication if you want? And to me, that represents an elementary interaction. This is what I'm aiming yeah, yeah. to. Because there are this see? sense of like general relativity where you have one side space time and the other side the quantum, the, the field. So they are the same thing. But it seems that they are a substrat or where both sides of the particle fields and the space-time emerge from this uh, network, this code of interaction. Yeah. But then even there, you still have the interaction of the observer, right? Yes. In general relativity, same thing. Yes. Here there's we have always, no, There's yes. always an Thank interaction you. between you, two or more abstract objects. And that's, Thank I think you, we got in trouble by saying particle. <laughs> but if we get rid of that, then we can go really... Don't, don't, give, don't give particle any meaning for the moment. You just focus on what you are looking for. And what I'm saying, you're not looking for space-time. You're looking for objects that interact. Call them objects, call them entities. It doesn't matter. I mean, mathematics is all made of uh, entities which are undeterminate. Just give them a name. The same e Lie algebra, the way I presented yesterday, which is the way it's done when you start from the, from the roots. It doesn't say what is a generator of the algebra. It says there is a generator of the algebra. What's important is to see what happens when you have two generators, what they do when they quote unquote interact. And that to me is the multiplication, is what the multiplication expresses. Okay? What's the relationship between them? Mathematics is not made with objects. Mathematics is made with relationships. It doesn't matter what the objects are. What defines the mathematics you're working on are the relationships. If I, not if I, the objects. I could support what you're saying by extending it to to the observer, but you, can't, you have to take the observer and get rid of humans altogether and mathematize this that, into yeah. a first principle. And Frank Wilkseck really nailed it for me, where he says that we're going to keep arguing about the meaning of quantum mechanics until forever, until somebody comes up with a formalism that conceptualizes some mathematical notion of of an observer, he called it a conscious observer. Now, this is Frank mm -hmm. Wilkseck, mind you. He's not yeah, yeah, some. Sure. He's no, not. No, sure. He's not like Roger Penrose <laughs> talking about, you know, yes. more fantastic ideas. Yeah. But you have to come up with a. He says you have to come up with a notion of a con of something that's a conscious observer, and he kind of puts that in quotation marks, um, that fully comports with quantum mechanics. And for me, I see this very simply as a transformer. So there's so. So, there, so everything uh, kind of reduces to triangles, where one vertex of the triangle is the observer or measure, and it's creating a relationship by transformation between two, at least two other points. If it's, if it's literally a dimensionless point, well, then there is no transformation. So you have to have at least two, and then you have at least one point, abstractly, to create a, a transformation. And that transformation encodes the information of the observer, right? It's vanish point, and the transformation. It's a, it's ang It's just the Pythagorean theorem at the end of the day. But some kind, something even in space time, even in a discretized quantum field theory, I think we're going to need, because we have this observer perspective in general relativity, and we have this observ this observer uh, measure in quantum mechanics. So this is what Frank Wilczek is getting at: that there's this deep missing first principles that mm -hmm. relates this, this most irreducible uh, Planck scale notion of a transformer into the formalism. No, no, I, I, I like this because, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the transformation that tells what's going on. Right? Right. Otherwise, and that's the interaction. The algebra itself doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And you can call that an interaction. Yeah. Yes, right? absolutely, yes, yes, I agree. But we need to have an interaction, but also we need to produce new objects. Uh, about the observer, first of all, I, I like how this is going on. It's already a, a discussion because we, then this looks like a standard talk. As I said, it's very unusual. We could have done this talk around the table. Uh, Klee definitely has tables with the capacity of holding all of us big, around the big table. Big tables. <laughs> so <laughs> this could have been a discussion. So don't, don't, I'm not presenting you results. Okay. But I invite you to discuss. I'm very glad. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, uh, Klee, and, and whoever is going to 
intervene because the, the, the aim is to have a discussion. Doesn't matter if I don't reach the end of the talk. Okay. But stimulating discussion is very important. Yes. I agree with the concept of time is that time emerges due to interaction. Yes. But the space, I think, the notion of space or the concept of space, I think it is beyond the notion of interaction. It is, it is something right related to the object itself because in principle if you have some kind of lattice and you fix the particles of the two groups and the QSM at every vertex in this in this uh, lattice. You fix it, something like you take a picture of it. In principle, you have a notion of the space here, although you don't have any kind of interaction between any kind of vertices here. But you don't have any kind of notion of time because there is no any kind of changing or, yeah, or yeah, anything yeah, happening. Yeah, 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 this yeah. That can be E8 or some like, absolute yeah. thing. It's yeah. like we need an absolute thing before the actions and, and the transformations. Yes. And, and that can be an algebra or E8 or something really foundational. In the e yes. Lattice, yes. Let, let, let me say that, uh, 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 in a sense, I agree. In a sense, I disagree. And I will try to tell you how, but that's a very good question, very good point. Um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm thinking of space. Um, as something, as I said before, you can measure. There is no way you can measure if space. What 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 means? I mean, you have to define distances, right? That's what space is. In other words, you can't take a picture of a lattice unless you have something. That, that, that exactly. That that, that that thing is there. <laughs> How do you know that that thing is there? But but you're right. E8 is not quite enough. I'm going to tell you how to overcome, in a sense, your very good point. I will try to convince you that maybe there is a way in which, yes, E8 is there, but space-time is also there in a very strange way. Uh, and again, this Occam razor is going to cut very drastically, you will see. Because going back to the observer, it's all connected with, uh, I mean, all this discussion is very, is very nice. Uh, I mean, of course, is, uh, you are great, but uh, I like it a lot. Um, as I said, the Occam razor cuts very drastically. I mean, the Occam razor I have in mind. Because going back to the observer, and because of his point, actually, we would like to start with no observer. So do not expect relativity to come in in the standard way mm, as you know a transformation between observers because the observers are not there the occam razor is so drastic in this talk of course <laughs> that we will start from a big bang i do not pretend that to be the big bang of our universe but it's some starting point of let's say an isolated system that's thermodynamically is a, is a notion that we are all used to Okay? So I don't pretend that to be, although I will call it Big Bang, the idea came from Alessio besides, inviting me to say, well, you have this vague idea in mind, you have to start from scratch. Starting from scratch and thinking of space-time, and relating to your point, forces you to say, Alessio, you're right. You have to start from nothing somehow. A few objects. And then space-time has to build up from there. This is a, another point that, to me, is crucial when we think about gravity. To me, gravity, not only to me, of course, I mean, what I, the little, very little, I understand from Einstein is that gravity is an expression somehow of space-time. So defining gravity is like understanding what space-time is. And the curvature that general relativity is going to give you depends on all the interactions. Mike probably is going to go back to that point. So gravity is, is inside everything because it's inside the notion of space-time. So that's why the title of the talk is The Expanding Universe, because we want to start from scratch, from a quote-unquote Big Bang, and develop from there, give him some rules. E8 is not going to be enough. We will see. We will see why. But eventually, what I will show you is a good hint 
for a model which is quantum mechanical because we are going to think in terms of quantum mechanics if I have time. I can stop any time because I like the discussion already. So <laughs> I already stimulated something. So whenever I have to stop, I will stop. But I will try to get to that point if I will have time. And, and I will show you that there is a genuine quantum mechanical model. And when I say quantum mechanical, I do not relate that much to the observer. The observer are going to come. But of course we are at the Big Bang. No observer is there. Nobody could possibly be there. Uh, so all this is going to come. It's going to emerge. And you will have a way of understanding somehow very intuitively what the collapse of a wave function is, for instance, if you want to think of quantum mechanics in that terms. To me, quantum mechanics means uh, at, the, at this level, so at the very elementary level, the very fundamental level, means think about superpositions, hence uh, interferences, hence amplitudes, that will become eventually when you observe something, they will become, through a partition function, they are going to become probability amplitudes. But at the moment, it's enough to have amplitudes. And what is going to give me an amplitude if I have the algebra? The structure constant, if the algebra is a Lie algebra. Anyhow, the rule of multiplication is going to give me numbers, numbers attached to that type of multiplication, so to that type of interaction. Let but, me try uh, to. Alessio, sorry. just one yeah, answer. Sure. Sure, I, sure. It, no, uh, no, I like that. It's well, better than my talk. I no, no, it's nothing, it's nothing new. I just want to ensure that what I said earlier about Wilksek, yes. uh, what I mean by that is not misunderstood. What people are talking about, like, like himself and uh, some others, uh, is that there is, uh, like Conway's uh, and Koken's notion of the strong free will theorem, there are these notions that we need to reduce to our anthropomorphized and very confusing notion of what consciousness is, what measurement is, and what free will is. And when you read those works, you get what they're saying. They're not talking about some animal or thing emerging after the Big Bang that is capable of doing the kinds of thoughts that, uh, that we do. It's like, how does a particle, as it interacts or relates to another particle, how would one mathematically define that? as a quote-unquote measurement transformation. Is this notion generalized, whereas in humans it's just a remarkably complex ensemble of, of fundamental Great. things yeah. that we Now label. I got you. Yeah. Perfectly. Perfect. Yeah. I like that very much. Okay, thank you for the comment. Okay, let me try to get to, to some point. Now, this is the other important point related to the interactions that relates by itself the interactions to the algebra. This is a very important uh, uh, ansatz, so to say. So another, if you want, basic principle, which seems to be very much supported by the experiments. All fundamental interactions look similar at short distances. The basic structure is very simple. It involves only three entities like the product in the algebra. So, here we come to Marcel a little bit. First step, define objects and elementary interactions with the hypothesis, like the beta handsets in integrable models, that every interaction is made of elementary interactions. Okay, so you start by defining what I call the elementary interactions, and then from those you build up complicated interactions, okay? And to me, the fundamental interactions are made of three objects, so like two ingoing and one outgoing, as it happens with the product of the algebra. This is the main hypothesis. This hypothesis gives the interactions a tree structure, notice, thus opening the way for a description of scattering amplitudes in terms of associahedra. If I have time, I will try to convince you that permutahedra either permutahedra or permutohedra, they're both accepted, uh, are better than associahedra. When you put an important gravitational effect into it, which is the expansion of space-time. I will try to, to get to that point if I can. So permutahedra is somehow a good thing, a good thing to, to, to think about. So objects 
and elementary interactions. As I said, I'm thinking of an algebra, and I want to start from a Lie algebra, or extensions of it, extensions because I'm thinking about exceptional periodicity. Um, but again, that doesn't matter. One can pick up the algebra uh, he likes, or she likes. So I start with the Lie algebra and state that the algebra, the algebra rules determine the building blocks of interactions, represented very simply as x, y goes to z, and calculated in this way, the commutator of x, y goes to z. This is represented, of course, by, by this. Uh, this probably I will skip, but this is uh, like a, a sort of a elementary scattering amplitude in which there is this thing here, uh, this, uh, let's say, intermediate boson, so to say. You can think about it in this way. And here appears naturally, if you think of the eight and the Lie algebra and the Jordan pairs and all these things, uh, that map, that uh, trilinear map that I showed yesterday. But that, that's just, just a detail, so forget about that, OK? So here is, is where Jordan pairs enters and all these things, just, just to justify why I was talking about those things yesterday. But that not, that's not the crucial part. Not even E8 is the crucial part, okay? The algebra is in this approach, of course. No geometry. Oh, sorry. Because you see, when you, when you look at something like that, you tend to think, well, this is something that interacts at some point in space and at some time. No? If you think in terms of Feynman diagrams, things like that. No? You tend to think about that. But here we have, and we stress we do not have geometry. So locality doesn't have any meaning. But we may state what the point is. So now we get a little bit into space because we, we reverse the concept of locality because we have no geometry. If we had a geometry, we can say, well, something happens at that point. But now we reverse the definition. And we said, a point is where objects interact. That is just our definition of a point. So we are building up somehow the geometry. Yes, please. Um, you said that uh, we wouldn't have E8 as a starting thing, but we would have the algebra, and then you point it there. Can no, I said the algebra could be another algebra. So oh. if somebody doesn't like E8 and likes oh. another algebra, but you it could start be with else. something like an algebra, like an E8. Al in you in my case, I would start with E8. Ah, so. so my, my project would be, would be focused on E8. So may I, may I uh, ask for a concession? If you, I agree to start with E8 as an algebra, but can you agree on some bijective relationship of the E8 Lie algebra to an E8 Lie lattice, where last time you and Alicia were here, I asked you, do you agree that you can derive the algebra from the lattice and vice, well, certainly vice versa? And you said, yeah, with a few tricks, you can derive the algebra from the lattice. And in that case, then it becomes a matter of taste where one might say, here are my abstract algebraic values and op op operators, and one may label it as length, or one may not. One may just use it as a number. It, it's meaningless at that point what you label it as. Yes. The point is that when you work, uh, this is something I already said yesterday, the point is that when you work with the Lie algebra, you're actually working, and that's needed badly, if you think of the photon, you need to work with the Cartan algebra as well. So you see that a root is not associated only to one object, particle, call it the way you want, field. To me, actually, that's a field. A generator of the Lie algebra is going to end up being a field, because then it develops as space-time develops, because we are expanding space-time. So the generator itself is going to be a field, but you can call it the way you want. Okay. Uh, but you see, to a root is associated not only one generator; it's also associated with Cartan. I know very little about lattices and, and the construction done with lattices, but I am afraid of losing the Cartans. Okay. Where is that, that concept there? So, as long so where as is the can, photon, for so instance? So as long as we can save that, and I don't know that we can, then we could agree that it's a matter of taste whether one recognizes the, the, the E8 Lie algebra versus the E8 Lie lattice. Because when I talked with Garrett last in Hawaii, yes. he, he was making the argument at, at lunch that 
well, CLE, you know, the Lie, the EA, uh, Lie algebra has objects that the Lie lattice doesn't have. And I said, okay, well, let me take that to Tony Smith. So I go to Tony Smith, yes. and, I, and then I used Garrett's objections. Garrett gave me specifics. And Tony then showed me how all of Garrett's objections were actually in there in the form of reflections, you know, operate various things that are there that Tony was right. And so it was, um, it seemed that it wasn't so clear which one of those two men was no, no. correct. Of course, there, there, there are strong links because you may say, okay, I associate with the Cartans because my point was on the Cartans, yeah. right? Yeah. Of course, you can, you can associate the Cartans to charges, weights, in terms, you know. Right. So you may say, okay, the Cartans are right there because they give charges to things. Certainly there is a way. But it has to be fixed very precisely. Yeah. See, the advantage is that when you start with E8, you have a very definite object. It's right. very strongly defined. Right. It's not flexible at all. No. It's all fixed. Yeah. And among the things that are fixed are the structure constants, so the multiplication rule. Yeah. That gives you numbers. You badly need those numbers to do quantum mechanics, right. to me at least. Right. Of course, maybe Tony Smith or <laughs> Garrett himself, you. So, Ray can, can, can find a way around it, but to me, I don't see any other way of, uh, uh, of introducing actually interferences. And that's crucial, because if you think quantum mechanically of what an attractive force is, for instance, how do we define that? Because we got to this point, of course, in the expansion of, of the universe that you are trying to figure out. Because you see, you need to have, actually we are imposing it, so this is going to be imposed, go back to, to your point somehow, if you're going outside the eight, by imposing, for instance, uh, energy momentum conservation. Of course, I have to tell you what momentum is, is related to the roots, so on and so forth. Uh, I, I will try to tell you if I get to that point. Uh, I have a way of saying what momentum is and so on. And so on. But we have also energy momentum conservation. So suppose we have an expansion and you have energy momentum conservation. How could you ever get something attractive? In order to get something attractive, you need to have that you have a superposition of momenta, and this is one of the points is in the first picture that was uh, at the beginning of the talk. That thing is achieved. Let me anticipate that. So, because this is an important point, so at that point I can stop anywhere. Uh, the important thing is that the universe is in a box, quote unquote, meaning that. It has a definite uh, dimension, okay? And it has always been in a box. If you think of the evolution starting from a Big Bang, so I'm taking the standard picture you know, of uh, the evolution starting from a Big Bang, it has always been in a box. Now, if you think quantum mechanically, what is a particle in a box? So again, we go back to first principle, elementary quantum mechanics. If you have quantum mechanics in a box, even a linear box, so a segment, okay, and you want to define the, 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 the Hilbert space of square integral functions on a finite interval, momentum is not even an emission operator. You cannot define momentum. Why? It's very simple. Because in quantum mechanics, if the particle is bound to be in the box, it has found the limits of the box. So it's bouncing back and forth. Everything you do with the particle in quantum mechanics in a box is a superposition of two momenta. This is going to be very simple. I'm going to show it. But let me anticipate that because it's, it's very simple and it's a statement that uh, I want to stress. Okay? So if you, th if you think of the ground state of a particle in a box, a linear box so in, on a defined on a segment, uh, it's a sinus of something, and it has to vanish on the two extremal points, okay? Because it's in the box, there's nothing outside it, okay? It's a continuity uh, condition, which is in standard quantum mechanics. If you, if you think, if you think of, 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 of the sign of, of something, okay, this is the superposition of two plane waves, e to the i px uh, plus e to the minus i px. Those quote unquote generalized states, because they do not belong to your Hilbert space, they are, they are <laughs> plane waves, 
They cannot be confined into a box. Okay? Those have definite momentum. But any particle which is inside the box cannot possibly have a definite momentum. And this is reflected by the fact that if you consider uh, the momentum operator on the Hilbert space that you're on, on, on uh, L2 of AB, if AB are the extreme, that is not an emission operator. So mathematics tells you immediately, oh, look, momentum is not defined. But you always have a, super, a superposition of two momenta. Now you can get react, uh, um, attractive forces. Because you start from a point, quote unquote, that doesn't mean that it's a geometric point. It simply means that all the particles that are there are allowed to interact. I go back to my definition of a point. A point is where particles interact. So what we call the point of the Big Bang is simply having a set of objects that can all interact among themselves, okay? which is interpreted as if they are in the point. But there is no point, no geometry, nothing. Okay? You start from that. And now the universe expands, but it's always a box. So those particles may interact with a certain amplitude. So we're still arguing in a quantum mechanical way. But they may not interact as well. If they do not, they expand in the box. They, they, they interact with the box itself. They enlarge the box. Why? Because they have momenta. But they do not have a definite momenta. They have a superposition of two momenta. That explains you also what, what background radiation is. Why we see the background radiation? Is that so intuitive? It is not. But if you think it in terms of the box, it's very intuitive. Because there is always a chance for a particle that could have interact, not to interact. So there is always a chance of a particle that has started at a certain time to, be, to have gone to the boundaries of the box and come back. Now you can have the right uh, energy conservation that gives you an attractive force. But that's not the end of the story because in quantum mechanics, in order to have attractive forces, you need to have interference. You need to have waves hmm, that when developed, they do annihilate on one side and enhance on the other side. If that side is, is, is the, the, the attractive direction of the force, you say that's an attractive force. So you need both the possibility of having opposite momenta, always, since the start, and interferences. The interferences, to me, are those phases that I calculate with the Lie algebra. So that's the other important point to me. If I had to stress why a Lie algebra rather than uh, a lattice, I would say, because the algebra gives me immediately what the phases are. So those structure constants, those multiplication rules, right. physically determine the phases. And so you get interference. Right. Both things are important if you think of an attractive force in quantum mechanics. You have, you have to think of, about standard quantum mechanics. You don't need to be fancy. What is an, an, an attractive force? You have to have used both things. And this gives you that. Sorry, but I didn't so long. No, no, no. So we're at a big phase transition here at QGR after a very long time of not doing physics. And we have a, we have a notion now of a wave function. And we have only two axioms. Well, the first is the axiom number three of Euclid that is required to prove Pythagorean's theorem. And so we assume Pythagorean's theorem to be true because we presume Euclid's um, axiom that the, that the distance uh, or that the object between two points is a straight object, flat. Okay. So then the other axiom is a little bit more complicated. It's, uh, you may call it, if you like, the principle of least uh, computational action. So we take solutions called a b equals p solutions which the a operator the a coefficient is your trivector relationships and how you take one of those relationships and relate it to your e8 root vector relationships and those are called a b equals p solutions and in the and the and the, the space the possibility space of a b equals p solu solutions allows one to order those solutions in various configurations and what guides the order is the, is the second axiom, the principle of least computational action. 
And what happens is if you, when we play these things, if we can get them into the computer this next, in this next 12 months and allow them to self-organize, what we get, what, I'm, what I am su suggesting that we will get, is we get these wave-like objects that are like David Heston's waves or like the de Broglie-Bohm notion of a wave function where it not only gives you your statistical probabilities according to some energetic principle, but it's also physically realistic as part of a system. So there's a central, there's a special object in it, um, and then, and so we call these empire waves. Yes, and, yes, I remember yep, from the last gonna, time the empire notion. Not, not but now, the, we're, not this now we've had a breakthrough, yes. or at least yes, sure, in sure, my sure. opinion, no, no, no. <laughs> we've had a breakthrough. <laughs> That's it's great. A, it, and I'm very excited to show you guys because great. I think, I think you, on you, Thursday we're going to have yeah, a full day for It that. is a very uh, simplified Occam's razor view. Good. And if it becomes physically realistic according to this energetic statistical principle, it will all be tied back easily to E8 because all it is is just operations Great. within no, e, no, the I, E8 Lie algebra. I, I, yes, I, I, I like that. And that's why yesterday I said we're going to get to that discussion. Yeah, about yeah, that's exactly. algebra that emerges yeah. and the transformation today because, yeah, this is, I agree with you. Uh, what, and I'm looking forward to hear from you on Thursday uh, the details, some details of this. Uh, of course, not all the details because we've worked on this uh, for a long time, but at least to try to, to, to get something out of it. Definitely, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm not, of course, I'm not claiming that this way of doing things, so starting from the algebra, rather than a lattice, for instance, uh, and, and get out an algebra out of there somehow, I mean, transformation. I don't think we need that. I don't think we need the lattice. I think that what I'm describing can can be okay. perfectly okay. done in the algebra. Okay, perfect. Yeah, well, it's well, a matter of taste, what you yes, label yes, things. Yes, yes. So uh, I want to insist that this, <clears throat> to me, this is also from my background. Right. Is a simple way of finding quantum mechanics right. inside. Right. But I'm not claiming that that's the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And not the only way. Yeah. I'm not even claiming that the algebra is the one I like. Yeah. <laughs> it could be something else. Well, you're in good company. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but uh, yes, sure. Thank you. Yes, Richard. I, I hate to interrupt because I would no. rather let you finish yeah, no, and talk later. But uh, you talks all day long, and I may not have much time to talk later. So I want to just raise a point. Yes. You talk a point. No time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, what's a point? When when you say there's no geometry, a yes. point is defined as simply the possibility of objects to interact. Exactly, exactly. Yes. But then when you describe a box, the universe as a box with a boundary and the evolution of phase interference in a wave function, you're presupposing some kind of concept. No, no, yes, but because... Space and time. The, yes, no, no, I'm going to get to that point, hopefully, but uh, you're right, absolutely. The difference is that I'm giving rules in which I create space-time. At that point, the geometry builds up and it's going to be discrete. It's going to be discrete because there is a, a cosmological clock which clicks an interaction after the other. That's the clock. So discrete time. But also discrete space. Think about it. What is discrete space if you live in a discrete space? It's very hard to define it. It's very, it's not intuitive at all. How can you say something is discrete if you live in it? But if you think in terms of interactions, that discreteness becomes a little bit intuitive. Because you say at the click of a clock, you get interactions. So you have a finite number of interactions among a finite number of objects. And with the rule I'm going to give you, that automatically produces a discrete space-time. Well, this discreteness comes out of the discreteness of the number of objects you that you have and the number of interactions that can occur, occur among those objects. That's an obvious notion of discreteness. But that reflects immediately into discrete space-time. But you have to start from a discrete space-time. That's a very un little intuitive to me. That's my limit. I wouldn't know how to, how to define it if, if I live inside it. I mean, how would I, ourselves, how do we know 
I mean, I do believe that, that space-time is discrete, our space-time, not the, the one of this model. I do believe that our space-time is discrete. How do we know it? Sorry. It can be known. I, I'm not sure how is that strike or not. It can be known only through the consciousness. If your consciousness is, if you are able to realize that your That's consciousness very is not yeah. continuous, then you are. You can realize that you are in in discrete space time. Okay. If you are okay. Going between existence and non-existence. But, but you have to give it some operative way. Is that operative? Good. Operative. Operative. Yeah. Thank you. To me, again, you know, a physical way, so an operative way of defining what discreteness says. It may be what you're saying. I have a hard time to understand it now, but, but an operation. Yes, sorry, great. Operation. Much better. An operational way. Yeah. An operational way to, to define discreteness. It could be what you say. I simply do not uh, understand much about consciousness and the other things that I would like to understand better, but I, that's my limit. Could be, but in, I, I myself do not have any intuitive way of, te of telling somebody, well, space-time is discrete, just uh, from other reasons. But with interactions, those are automatically discrete because it's a finite number of objects. Uh, so a finite number of interactions among those, those objects, and that's definitely something that is obviously discrete. So I would say that space-time is discrete because of that. So I have a question. Yes. Okay, yes. So you're, you're looking at the interactions of particles, and you're wanting to, you know, categorize how their interactions go about. Yes. So, <clears throat> uh, in so far as two particles interact to become another third particle. It may. There is also uh, always a probability that does it, and a probability amplitude, so okay, to say. There is an amplitude, let's call it, that that happens, right. but it could also not interact, even if in principle it could. So even if the algebra tells it could interact, there is also an amplitude with which it does not interact. And if, that, if it does not, as I'm going to show you, that creates an expansion. It's interacting with the box, which constrains it. And by interacting with the box, it expands the box. Sorry, but I interrupted you. Well, you for, that was not the end of the, uh, your I question, was, I guess. I was just wondering, because like, um, yes. that was your first, uh, it just seems like you could... Um, almost write out a multiplication table if, if you have all the particle types listed in one column. Yes. You know, you just start fleshing it out and that'll be some sort of algebraic structure if it falls. You know. I will show you one of those tables yeah, actually at the end yeah. of the talk if, uh, okay. if I get to that. I will actually show you a table because everything I want to do is calculable. Mm -hmm. I want to actually calculate numbers, including scattering amplitudes, numbers get numbers out of the theory. They could be all wrong. Who knows? We need to put them on the computer because it's going to be crazy calculations. Very simple calculations, but crazy in terms of the time you need to perform those calculations. Uh, eventually, if this project goes through, you're going to need a mainframe computer. Definitely. Do you have access At to least. a mainframe computer? No, personally, I do not. Okay. But that, that, that will be... <laughs> That would be, no, the, the little test that I did <laughs> was up to the cosmological time, five Planck times. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Uh, so with the program I did, and it, that produces the tables like the, those you, you were saying, I call the button bang, <laughs> and I could bang only five times. That the six times it starts with my laptop. With, with, the, with the MacBook Pro, it starts being a little slow. With seven, I never try. <laughs> because the, the, the tables that you produce are huge. But you see, in principle, you have all the numbers. I still have to tell you how, how you get the expansion and how Elsa's loans or Moody Potter, or I learned yesterday from Ray, and that's to me extremely interesting, a construction that Ray has, which is analogous to the Moody Potter way of projecting to four dimensions and then eventually to three through the tetrahedra. I'll try to get to that point. But in any case, I, I will show you that everything produces numbers. So you can eventually put everything in the computer because you do not have time enough to calculate by hands, but the calculations are very simple in principle. But you definitely need a computer to perform them. And eventually, that's to be a mainframe computer, definitely, because, I mean, it's going to be gigantic. 
because you need the ideal formalism to get it into the computer in the most economical way, and that and that's yes. what I'm you need thinking. that, and and you would like to have also a picture of what's going on, right? Because if you can perform that calculations in such in such a way that uh, you get to you get to a certain time, and I mean you can extend the time for for, for some time. <laughs> So eventually, you want to see clustering. If you see numbers, uh, that's hard to see. So the other thing that one should do on a mainframe computer is try to put those numbers in a pictorial way. So you have to, to, have, you know, to see what happens. Uh, so give different uh, symbols uh, to different uh, objects uh, and see if, if, we get, if you get attractive forces and all these things. So eventually, uh, in the long run, this is, this is a huge program. It's a huge research plan. Uh, it can be done, though. I mean, I, I don't think it would take much time. Uh, I would estimate a couple of years. But at that point, you might have a way of understanding if, if this model works. It may not. It's, it's very hard to figure out what's going on. Because you have interferences, you have expansion of the space-time, uh, you eventually would like to put everything graphically into a gravitahedra, which is not something I know what it is. It's just a name I gave, and it was approved by Mike, so I was happy. <laughs> and was approved by Alessio, and was even more happy, because both of them are great at finding the, the right names. Think of the jazz piece through you and so on. So, so gravitahedra, as I will try to, to mention later, is just a name I gave because it's related to permutaedra and so on and so forth. So you have some axiomatic of that, that you can represent in that way, that would be part of the program. But you also have to make calculations and get numbers. Calculate um, amplitudes, scattering amplitudes. And that's doable. From the recipe that I'm going to give you, it's perfectly doable. There's nothing difficult what in, about the in principle. In principle, with this first principles model, if you could calculate it, generate approximations of, of the observed fundamental constants, the three fundamental constants? Well, you will see the velocity of light already incorporated into the model. Plugged or coming Pl right out of the first principles? Mm, I will tell you why, uh, how, but uh, in a, I would say more plugged that, that, uh, that coming from first principles. Okay. There are many weaknesses in this model, of course. I mean, it's a very ambitious program, so you cannot expect that everything is self-contained and easy. And, uh, but there are a certain number of recipes. Right. So at least there is a model, yeah. and it's calculable. That's the most important thing. But of course, many things are forced in it. And I will tell you exactly why this is relativistic. So far, I've been trying to tell you why it is quantum mechanical. And I will tell you why it's relativistic with the construction related to Elsa's loans and so forth. And, uh, I will tell you about that in a moment. So one of the constants is there, the other ones... Well, of course, the Planck length is also imposed because you say that the click of the clock is a Planck time click. Uh, the expansion is going to be in Planck units. Uh, um, the rest, who knows? We'll see. Because, you see, the aim is not to explain whatever is here in, the, in our universe today. The aim is to have some axioms that can tell you the principles, the code, somehow, of a universe that might resemble ours. But since you have to start from the Big Bang, it's very far from the present universe. And of course, that I mean, will never reach to these times, even with a mainframe computer, of course. <laughs> uh, so let me try to, to raise a few points. Let's see if I can make it. Um, I think I can skip, skip this. We, we probably all know why uh, Lie algebra is interesting uh, because of uh, quantum field theory reasons. Think of Young Mills. Uh, uh, exceptional Lie algebras appear here and there in many theories independently, including, of course, uh, string theories and so on and so forth. Uh, this is important. The Lie algebra, as a common language between quantum mechanics and gravity, 
where space-time derivations are commutators and the Leibniz rule of the derivation is just the Jacobi identity. This is just the Jacobi identity if this transformation is a Lie algebra action, so the adjoint action of a generator. Uh, in quantum mechanics, a, cha a change of a physical quantity, let's say G, is given by a commutator. For instance, if you want to transform it in time, in standard quantum mechanics, you commute it with the Hamiltonian. Uh, so there are many reasons why, why the algebra, as we all know, because the algebra has been into physics for such a long time, it's for, for so many reasons that I certainly don't need to, to, to explain it to you any further. Uh, this is related, this thing is related again to Jordan Peirce, but forget about that. So, um, yes. Uh, Marcelo requests a break. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's good because I'm starting a new page. Let's, let's take a break. Okay. Are we all here? Okay. Can I go? Okay. Good. So <clears throat> let's continue. Thank you for your patience, by the way. Uh, so this is the outline. As I said, I start from, uh, let's call it Big Bang. We agree on what it is. I mean, something, we start from scratch somehow. Not completely from scratch, of course. We must have some objects. Thinking of E8 and thinking of the Occam razors, let's try to get the minimum amount of objects to start with. What is the minimum amount of objects uh, in E8? These are the generators related to nine roots because you get the eight uh, simple roots, natural choice of course to, to make, that give you all the positive roots, 120, it's enough to, to select, uh, not randomly, yeah. but you can select only one negative root, which is going to be this alpha 9, to generate all the roots uh, of, uh, of E8. And by that I mean something that is not completely trivial. I mean that I can generate every root in such a way that that root can be expressed as a sum of simple roots in which each root can intervene many times, but in such a way that every subsum is always a root. You see, what, what you want to get, you start with nine roots, okay? And you want to get all the roots of E8 by interaction. This means that you start making those interact, you, you get new roots. So every time you need to get new roots. And you, might, you must be sure that you get all of them with this procedure. So if they keep interacting, eventually you produce all of them. That's a, a, a statement that is known in Lie algebra. It's not a trivial statement at all. But it is well known. And in this sense, this is the minimum number of objects you can start with. I'm relating that to the roots. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to uh, but of course, I'm thinking of the generators associated to those roots. Yes. So why, why the, uh, how is the alpha nine chosen then? The alpha nine is a negative root. Is there any negative? Root? No, not any, not any. Yeah. For instance, yeah, it, it yeah. for instance it works with the lowest height root. With that, it works for sure, because then you add the positive roots and you get all the negative roots plus all the positive roots that are already given to you by the simple roots. The simple roots would be alpha 1 to alpha 8, well, I mean, standard notation, so for 1 to 8. The ninth one is negative. Uh, in the notations that on, with both, on which both agree, it could be uh, 1 minus 1, 0, 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 1 minus 1, up to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 plus 1, and then the spinner. So th those, in any case, it doesn't matter. You see, E8 is defined by the Dinkin diagram. So you can represent those roots with the, what I called K, which would be these vectors with the one somewhere and zeros somewhere else, okay? But uh, that's, that's just a way of representing the roots to make calculations. But what's, what's matters, what matters is that these are the roots and they are linked among themselves. Going back to the point that what's important is that the relationships between objects, not the objects themselves. Uh, they have to relate according to the Dinkin diagram ru rules. So alpha 1 has to give a scalar product minus 1 with alpha 2. 
zero with alpha three and so on, and then you keep going like that way. So the important thing is that they are simple roots, no matter how you represent them. You need to add another root, which is of course negative, in order to get also all the negative roots. And this is a well-known result, result in, in Lie algebras, okay? So I want to get all of them, positive and negative. That's why the, the, the simple roots are not enough, okay? Because we will never generate a negative root when you add up simple roots, okay? And not only that, as I said, I mean, this would generate through, let's call them interactions, all of them. You're sure you, that you will end up with all the roots of the eight, okay? And this is the minimum amount, so Occam Razor, okay, let's stick to those, okay? Take the minimum ones. So we got nine roots to start with. We assign, this is the key point, uh, we assign it, so we go outside the eight, as you were rightly saying, we assign opposite three momenta, the reason why opposite is the, the, the box argument that I presented before, okay? They're always in a box from, from the start. So it's intuitive to assign not just one momenta, but two opposite momenta to each of them. So you must somehow get to a three moment. Why a three momentum? Because energy is a very tricky, difficult thing to implement. So again, let's use the Occam razor again, once more, and say all these initial particles are associated to massless on-shell objects. You impose that. So you say that that three momentum determines the energy. So the energy is just the modulus of this three momentum. So the three momentum is enough. Now you have to associate this uh, plus minus p, where p is the momentum, to the roots. Here comes into the game Elsa Sloan or Moody Patera, and I would say even better for what I heard from Ray, his construction, which is close to Moody Patera ones, to the Moody Patera one. Uh, this is uh, again a recipe to uh, project somehow to three dimensions. We are going to end up with a tetrahedron in any case, in both cases. Uh, I will show you just the result of that, but I have all the details worked out. So. I, I can go into the details, but not during this talk. I will just tell you the outcome. But this is the way you associate a, a plus minus p to each of those simple roots. Th this is the starting point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Let yes. me stress that, I mean, as we discussed, I yes. mean, the point is that uh, we are somehow assuming that we want to end up with a three-dimensional space. I mean, uh, otherwise you might uh, assign other uh, dimensionalities. Yes. The point is that the dimensionality of space uh, is not emerging, it is uh, operatively defined, assumed. Yes, yes, right? yes. So, but you see, uh, this, this, can, this can follow from the operator algebras, because in the operator algebras that you decompose EA into with the magic star projection, they're rank yeah. three. Yeah. Th this was my original way of thinking so, about it. And then but we've already proven, or you've proved, yeah. that those, um, those orthogonal primitive idempotents can be transformed to uh, the vertices yes. of this tetrahedra. So it's not really assuming once, you, you just assume the operator algebra structure and you get this for free. Uh, yes, so, but you can pick another it, dimension yes. and get it as well. I think is what Alicia's point. I you could, you could uh, say four D and yes. do the same thing. Yes, at the end we are. I mean, I think we all agree that uh, what Mike said and what Pierre was proposing is actually something related to spectral dimensions of the operators that you have uh, as a uh, Jordan algebra. Yes, but uh, you see. Yes, that, no, that, 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 that's true. It's, it's definitely imposed, but I also want to get the relativity part out of it. Okay. Right. And so I need to relate to that. So I need to go to energy momentum somehow. Uh, I limit myself to three momentum because I want to consider massless particles as a simple, for, for simplicity. I mean, uh, but and then I impose energy momentum conservation. And the evolution of space-time, together with this recipe, automatically gives you a relativistic model. Yeah. There is nothing that can propagate at a speed higher than the speed of light. 
because of this recipe that I'm completing in a moment. So the other reason is that one. Okay, yes, you want to have a, eventually a, a, a three-dimensional space-time, but you also want to have a relativistic model because eventually you want to have gravity, so you want to meet also general relativity, understand curvature and all these things. Uh, you know, just to add a comment to Alicio's uh, statement. So I hope on tomorrow's presentation to be able to show you a glimpse of why the, the day after tomorrow. The Thursday, Thursday, I hope to be able to show you a glimpse of why taking E8 and the principle of least computational action requires for the maximum computational savings, just algebraic operation savings, to it these waveforms require 4D and 3D. 3D is the only oh, dimension okay. where you can so have knots, oh, for oh, example. Right. There's a principle. That right, you need braid theory and knot theory, and all of that comes back down to a foundational anionic theory, Fibonacci anions. This would be very good because yes. with your approach, you get three, and with a spectral approach based on E8, and actually based also on EP, if you want to go, it's always three dimensional spectral damage. Right, and we require the Elser Sloan to have some ontological realism. So our three ontological real objects are the E8 in okay. its algebraic and geometric forms, Elser Sloan in its uh, icosionic algebraic yes. form, and then all the way down to the dynamics of ordered sets. And it's something you said I wrote down because it's yes. exactly what, I, what I'll say to, on Thursday, which is it, what is important is not a given projection or transformation of E8, but only the ordered sets. It's the ordered set that defines change, where you yes. can call it time or yeah. momentum. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah, you need to have that. Otherwise, yeah, everything is vague. OK, that's great. Um, so I think I also had a comment, but I forgot. Let's go on. Um, this is what I already said. So we, put, uh, we consider massless, on-shell massless particles. Uh, I'm going to tell you in a moment, and let me anticipate that, that I can define all of those to be fermions. This is another thing I like. So eventually, this model is going to start from nine fermions. And this is quite tricky because, I mean, it's not that easy to understand that these are associated to spinners of the orthogonal groups. Because the, the, the way you normally take the, the simple roots, which is what Dragon was mentioning before, you would have bosons and fermions, meaning spinners with respect to some orthogonal group and, and, and the uh, generators of the orthogonal group themselves. Uh, but recently, I, I just wrote down a way uh, of having all the roots being fermionic. So this is what is going to be, let me anticipate this, uh, this is going uh, to be the, the, the initial conditions. Nine particles which are all fermionic. Uh, so let's let's continue. This I already said and, and stressed. The reason for having opposite momentum is related to the simple quantum mechanics in a box. Yes, it's, it's always a superposition of objects which has which have opposite uh, momenta. Uh, this is what I already told you. This is the ground state from standard quantum mechanics of a particle on a segment. And uh, it's obviously a superposition of two plane waves. These, these have uh, definite momenta, but this one does not. It's a superposition. These are outside the space allowed. This is inside. And cannot possibly have a definite momentum. But it's a superposition of two opposite ones. So now is the key point. Here is where relativity enters the picture. So now we maintain the same momenta, which means that this coefficient in front of the x, if you think in terms of the momenta of a plane wave, uh, this is going to stay the same. And now I want to enlarge the box. So I start from a box which, is, which goes from minus a to plus a, and then I start enlarging it by integer numbers, so a multiple of a. So I, I start enlarging the box. Okay by multiples of, of a. Uh, so this n is just a, a natural number. Uh, and this is, the again, the ground state for the particle that now represents the same particle as before, 
with the same energy, but on an extended box. So it's like standard quantum mechanics, but this is not quite done in standard quantum mechanics. You do not consider that the box is enlarging. Okay, so this is a, this is a crucial point. And the way it gets enlarged is by the quantity P over E, where E is the energy. And this, this is what makes it trivially a relativistic model in the sense of special relativity. Where is general relativity? General relativity is in all the interactions. Because now you're building up space and the interactions produce this particle and can produce again the same particle that you had before that now have bent because of energy momentum conservation. It's very simple, very elementary. So as I said from the beginning, there's nothing deep into it. Don't think of any strange theory in physics. Just think of first principle, think of simple things. But put everything together and you find a natural way of explaining or, un or uh, somehow understanding a model in which you have curvature, in which you have relativity, in which you have quantum mechanics, erasing, I mean, uh, arising, sorry, in a trivial way, with simple concepts. Uh, this is this function as the box increases, okay? Say in some units, uh, the, the a is equal to 1, then it's going to be equal to 2, equal to 3, okay? This is the function, this function here. But of course, we do not want to consider this. This is the reason why we want to get to opposite momenta. But what we are going to do is to go from here, so think of the peaks only, or the maxima and minima. We are going to discretize this picture. This is what standard mechanics would tell you. But what we say is that we, if we start with the particle which is here, a, a click of the clock later, so a one time later, this is going to be here and here. But notice the phase. This is going to be the phase which is opposite to that one. This is simply simple quantum mechanics. So we keep presenting our arguments in terms of quantum mechanics. Very simple, very intuitive. I'm sorry, when you say discrete, so are you saying... Yes. That you consider only the peak. Only the peak. So this is, is, okay. Yeah. It's concentrated only in zero. Yeah. Okay. So now next time the particle is going to be here in minus one or in plus one. Probably the minus one and plus one cannot be read from there, but it's right here. This is minus one. This is a plus one. So it's going to be concentrated on the maxima and minima. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the, in the model I'm thinking about. Because when it expands, it expands by this quantity. So it's one unit of these quantities, okay? So once you have all this, let's see if I have to say anything else, else about it. So you get a discretized picture. Uh, notice, by the way, that quantum mechanics tells you that this becomes anti-symmetric first, then symmetric, then anti-symmetric again. Question, has this something to do with the Pauli principle? Do some of those represent fermions and, I mean, with the uh, uh, fermionic type of statistics and the other ones, bosons? Maybe not. I don't know. But it's curious that you get the phase of every time something that becomes symmetric and then anti-symmetric, then symmetric and then anti-symmetric. That's just a curiosity, but I have no answers about that. So your boundary conditions so your life are or? evolving? It looks like your boundary conditions are changing there. Those they look different for n equals 1 in and equals I'm just representing this, this function. But yes, as Mike said, this, it is, is, this, is, is, uh, this, is, this is implying the space expansion, which this is, is the, space uh, expansion. the extremities of the... This is exactly yes, the space expansion. Square, yes. So it seems like what's dynamic are the boundary conditions. Yes, yes, exactly. Because that, that forces you uh, to, to have this function that then you discretize that. Okay. It's because of the boundary. So it's strictly related to the fact that we are in a box. And nobody can object that. A growing box. A growing box, but though. Is it a growing box. the case that the wave function will expand, maintaining the same wavelength? Yes, because we, want, we, we, we have in mind a particle that has a certain momentum. So right, you see, but if, a, if, a, if you have a particle in a box and the box expands, yes. typically in quantum mechanics, the momentum could change because... It could, definitely. 
but not in, not in the case we have. Okay. You see, I wanted to enlarge the box, yeah. keeping the same momentum. Okay. Because you see, again, let me tell you again what is the overall picture, which is extremely simple. There is a chance, quote unquote, that a particle interacts, but there is also a chance always, so an amplitude, that it does not interact. So this expansion occurs for every object you create. All of them expand. So what quantum mechanics and this simple argument tells you is that they do expand in this, in this way. So this is like a co-algebra. So you start with something here, a generator, then you get uh, x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x representing that one. I, I, will go, uh, I will tell you about that later, but that's not my point now. Uh, but you see, every time you have a particle here or here, of course, with certain amplitudes and, and phases that you see, they're not trivial, uh, they have both momenta all the time. So you're seeing background radiation right there. What is background radiation? There are always particles, especially in particular the first ones that you start with, they're the, fir the first that bounce back. Yeah, but the background radiation actually cools as the universe expands. Of course it does. And you see, this lowers, I mean, maybe it's not quite clear here. But it's not the amplitude that lowers, it's the wavelength that gets longer. It starts off at very high energy photons and now it's at these sure. microwaves. Yes, because you may say, uh, it's the same thing in here though. You may say, wait a minute, w how you conserve the total energy of everything, okay? You start with, with something and you keep creating particles. And those particles, all of them have energies. Plus, there are particles that keep their momentum, so it looks like you are contradicting the, the total energy conservation. It is not, because you do not, do not have to think classically. What's actually going on is that there is a certain amplitude for that process to occur. That's, that way it makes the difference. So what goes instead of, of lowering uh, or enlarging the, the wavelength is the fact that that can occur with an amplitude that you have to sum to the other, all the other amplitudes for that object to be somewhere and, and so on and so forth. Here we go to the other point about the scattering amplitudes that I want to tell you about. But this is the way I'm, 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 I'm arguing and reasoning. Okay? Because otherwise you violate energy conservation right away, even though it occurs at every interaction. But the total energy, I mean, <laughs> but since there is an amplitude for that. So in each single process, that eventually you consider when you consider a scattering amplitude, that energy is going to be conserved. Okay. Thank you for, the, for all these questions. I'm, I'm very glad about this. Oh, I have a, okay. a question or a comment. Yes, sure. Yes, I think this, this is a good uh, Should I go back to the previous one? Yes, the, the harmonic oscillator, but uh, uh, after the quasi-crystalline uh, projection in it's, our space... It's not actually an harmonic oscillator. Uh, it looks like. It, it, it it's looks the like, same, yes. the same function, I agree. Uh, but it's not the harmonic oscillation. Oh. There is no potentials behind it. Oh, okay. This is just the particles in a box. Hmm. But uh, so it's a anyway, yes, as, uh, as Mike was we'll saying. We'll say. It's a periodic function. Yeah, it and, looks like uh, it, it looks like a crystal. Yeah, I agree with that. It will be replaced by an anharmonic uh, function mm -hmm. with a Fibonacci chain coming here inside of the regular uh, uh -huh. numbers. Uh, so uh, it will be right, more complicated and more interesting. You can do the same <laughs> concept, I suppose, somehow in a uh, ordered but a periodic okay. pattern. Okay. So with the same concept, you know, the same notions. Okay. Yes, a continuous uh, oscillation, but uh, the period will be either one or five, depending on the, what is encoded in the Fibonacci world. And yes. we will see uh, self-similarity at some scale. Uh, every golden I will tell scale. you how, how Elsa Sloan and, and, uh, or Moody Patera or your 
mm. construction would end. It's good what, 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 what Ray says. <laughs> and that's quite interesting because you, s you look at those functions and you say, well, that's the harmonic oscillator. Actually, it's not. Uh, as Mike was mentioning before, this is just due to the boundaries of the box. It's, it's just a particle with, in a box. There is no, no potential in terms of, quantum, of standard quantum mechanics, but the fact that it's limited in a box. Uh, but it looks like an harmonic oscillator. I, I say that because very often, in, in particular in string theory, you know, everything is based on you know, the, uh, harmonic oscillators and frequencies and so on and so forth. It looks like that, but it's just the boundary of the universe that produces these functions that are like the harmonic oscillator functions. Uh, this is an interesting point, I think. Yes? There is an interesting thing here that you are giving some kind of a concept or a reason for the Pauli principle as it emerges from the expansion of this whole function. I'm, I'm not at all sure about that. As I was saying, I'm posing more questions than answers in this talk. I'm saying that very vaguely, the symmetric and anti-symmetric uh, chain of, 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 of functions might relate to the Pauli exclusion principle. But it's not quite the Pauli exclusion principle. That's to me. That to me is, is a mystery. I, I didn't. I, I do not have any 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 way of uh, including the Pauli exclusion principle in my. I've always thought about that, but so far I have no idea. So I, any any idea would be very welcome. Yes. I'll come back to that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let me briefly mention this. Uh, you may. Try to put this expansion, since you see you start with a, an object in one point and then you get it with a certain chance here or with a certain chance somewhere else. So it resembles the coproduct in a Hopf algebra. And here I'm taking the, 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 the Hopf algebra, not the formed, the standard one, where the coproduct Sorry for this delta, it's not the set of simple roots, of course. This is the usual standard symbol for the uh, coproduct in a Hopf algebra. Uh, you define it this way, you have the antipode, the co-unity, and so on and so forth. And you have somehow a way of representing this expansion through the co-algebra that you can associate it with your algebra. This has to be developed. Again, this is a hint. There's a big question mark on that. But that's a very interesting question mark. Because if you could put the expansion of space-time in, in the co-algebra structure of your structure, that would be great. Because that would tell you that the expansion is, is the co-algebra part, and the interactions are the algebra part. That would be fantastic. It's going to be extremely complicated. It's not an easy uh, problem to solve. So this is a very vague, as all the talk is very vague hint for, for trying to look for a co-algebra structure, but it's going to be quite delicate and, and difficult, simply because you're going to develop in three dimensions. So it's not just a chain like that with you know, tensor products and, and, and one everywhere and the next somewhere and so on and so forth, because that has to be developed in three dimensions. And since the uh, Hopf algebra is obviously based on the universal enveloping algebra, you cannot do a Hopf algebra on the Lie algebra. You have to go to the universal enveloping algebra. You need an associative object. Uh, that universal enveloping algebra is like, uh, it has to be like a three-dimensional generalization of a universal enveloping algebra. Again, I'm being, and I know, very, very vague. Just some suggestions but very interesting. I think that would be great because then you could start putting everything consistently inside one structure. You would have both the expansion and the interactions in an one consistent algebraic structure, which has to include the quadruple part. Do you have a vague uh, hint yes. on, uh, on um, the inflationary period? Or <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely much, not. Much. Okay. As absolute, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. uh, um, actually, well, in this model is not even considered an inflationary period. Not everybody believes in inflation, by the way, notwithstanding the success of the inflationary theories. Okay. 
if I'm not mistaken, maybe you can correct me. I think Penrose doesn't believe in that, first of all. He doesn't quite believe in inflation. But here there's no inflation. Okay. okay, so it's not hardcore. Uh, no. it, how literally you take the big bang, is it like actually going down to a point or is it... Right. Here there is no inflation because, as I showed you before, it could be implemented. I mean, many things can be changed. I don't want to propose this as a fixed thing. Actually, I'm ready to, 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 to welcome any ideas that can improve this. This is just something very basic. Tony is very algebraic. It needs like, to be improved a lot. Tony is pretty but, algebraic and you can connect that to some of his stuff. And I would love to see what the heck Tony is thinking on, on the, um, on the ex inflation period. He's got something. It could be bullshit, okay. but he, he'll have something that'll vaguely relate to what you're doing. So, uh, again, another interesting question, uh, all the questions that I've had so far. Uh, but let me just tell you that one, this one is not question. inflationary because, you see, the, the, the rule that I gave, oh, right. that they expand by so P over E, right. makes it, I and mean, there is no tachyon. Well, so it's the, impossible to go up faster than Then you don't want it to inflate, but you at least want an explanation for the, um, the observational you know, evidence, right? Oh, evidence yes, sure. Proof, no, no, but yes. That, that, you know, see, but that is, this, this is one of the things that should hopefully come w once you get the computer calculation yeah. and actually see what, what these rules give you. See, we need here a massive computational ability soon, and I don't know how to get it because I'm not part of a university and we're not part of a, a big corporation that has a supercomputer. So we got to figure out a way in our combined networks to get access yes. to big computation. Yeah, a lot of that's uh, submitting yeah. a job, then you wait in line, and then yeah, over, if you, get, you can wait in line if you're at a university. Yeah, with a common but, uh, we effort. can't even wait in line. With a common effort, we can get to that. I yeah. guess. Okay, we'll talk. We need to include the academics somehow, and that's yeah. important to me. Yeah. Any, anyhow. So, um, uh, have you also um, thought to go from this to the quantum version of E8, the, the quantum group of E8? Oh, the quantum group of E8? Yes. No, which is, no. Uh, uh, which is the next step. Uh, as of now, I have no need for, for a deformation parameter. Actually, with E8, we can have up to eight deformation parameters. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I, I do, not, do not have any, any need for that as, uh, for the moment. But uh, if there is a reason why that should be there, we'd be glad to put it inside because I actually worked a lot on quantum groups. So can I, I, I wouldn't mind having those, but I need reason for them to be there. And I don't have it so Because far. here we are halfway with... Uh, Universal uh, enveloping algebra. Yes, so but but so far I don't consider it as deformed. Mm -hmm. I only need the, the coproduct and the and the antipode to, to make this to reproduce those functions discretized that I was showing before. Okay, that would explain that simply. It's a very simple argument. We can then go over it again more. Mm -hmm. Yes. So sorry, sorry. we. <coughs> We gave you an extra hour because we wanted to hear all this more. <laughs> but because of all of our questions and discussion, we're actually not making. Can we limit some of the questions yeah. a little bit to let him continue some more? Yeah. <laughs> I'll try to be fast. I, I, I don't think there is much more to say, so I, I hope I'll be fast. I don't even remember no, now what, what's I next. But fast. Take your time, but I just want no, no, no. But I mean, there are no many arguments, so, so I can be fast without without okay. rushing. <laughs> he, he wanted the discussion, so I. I think, but I think we went too far on the discussions because we now have 15 minutes and I'm worried about what you have left. But, but it was pretty good discussion. Oh, yes, yes. M much more important than the talk itself. <laughs> uh, okay. So this is a point I've already raised. Uh, the initial generators, so the generators associated to those nine roots, the eight simple roots plus the negative one, they are allowed to interact among themselves. With the definition of a point that I gave before, this is interpreted as they are all in the same point. Although there is no geometry, no singularity, as we usually think in terms of the Big Bang, there is nothing of this. There is actually no point of an a priori space. It's just a definition of a point, because they all interact there, but I've made this point already before. Uh, each interaction, so to summarize, has two effects produce a new particle through the interaction. Through, so if, you could, if we could eventually put it in a Hopf algebra uh, structure, uh, the algebraic part would produce new particles. 
the coalgebra part would create new points. Both, both things uh, uh, occur every time with an amplitude which is calculable precisely. I mean, as I said, I want to get numbers out of this thing because that would be worth it by itself. Even though this model fails, it's worth to me having it fail. Meaning that at least we have a model in which you explain a lot of things. And it's also very didact uh, didactical. Is that, a, is that correct? <laughs> because it tells you a lot about simple principles about the nature of quantum mechanics, the way I view it. There are many other points of view, of course, and I'm not pretending this is the only one. Uh, this coalgebra part. Somehow, the, the coalgebra part for a physicist is something strange. For mathematicians, nothing. It's fine. No problems. But to figure it out is a little somehow difficult. This is, makes it very intuitive. You know? The fact that this generator is here, then is here and there, then, and so on and so forth. So it's a model that by itself, I think, it, it, it would be nice. It would, it would sell, quote unquote, uh, to the academia. Uh, so if this instead produces something that has uh, contact with the reality the way we perceive it, that would be fantastic. I think this is worth it by itself. Uh, so this I explained, quantum nature, yeah, I think I'm almost at the end. I have to show you uh, Elsa's loan. Structures content, then, yeah. Okay, I think this, this is fine. So you see what emerges, what emerges is a quantum field, which to me is identified with the generators themselves. Because see, a generator is not here, there, or anywhere. But with some amplitudes, Eventually, with the space expanding, it's going to be with some amplitudes here or there or there. It is still the same generator. I will show you a table at the end, uh, going back to what Dagan was saying before, in which you actually see it. Uh, so I would say that the generator itself is like the field. What is a particle now? Well, a particle is the occurrence of that generator in some point in space, for instance. Okay? So it all comes, it all emerges very naturally from, from, from what you start with. And you see that this generator automatically spreads like a quantum wave. And as I will show you in the table that I've calculated uh, with the computer, um, it spreads in momentum as well as in space, each generator. Again, this is very quantum mechanical. And each of these occur with a certain amplitude, which is attached to it. So there is an amplitude for a particle to be in a certain point and with a certain momentum. Two particles interact only where they overlap at the same point. This is another condition which is very important. So it's again locality, but reversed. When you have imagined that after a certain amount of time, uh, you get your particle that can be here, there, or there with some probability and with some momentum. How do particles interact at that time? Only the part of the, of the, of the field that overlaps at the same point is allowed to, to interact according to the Lie algebra rules. Okay? I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. So the, the particle has like an infinite field usually, so it's always going to be interacting with all the other particles, right? And well, consider that we are in a three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So it does expand, but it expands on, on one direction, which is the direction of the three momentum. That actually constantly changes, because with the interaction, the, the momentum changes. But so it changes. In the, so it's not. It's not. Uh, it can. It can't be everywhere. A single generator. It cannot. So uh, I will show you with the calculations, maybe. Okay, because yeah, I'm talking about the EM field and all that, not just the momentum, but... She wants to build an EM field and... Charged particle, the field goes to infinity. I mean, it dies off one over R squared, but in theory, the, the field is there in a diminishing amount. 
anymore. But, but if, but you, dis if you, dis if you discretize the field, then you can have points where there won't be interactions. Yes. Right, but still it goes to infinity. Yes. No, there will be interactions among certain generators, but not, not, for, not each generator is going to be on the whole space. Okay. That, that's not going to occur. Uh, okay, so as I said, I'm not giving you the details, but just to, to, to tell you that I've calculated things. Uh, this would be the, the, the three momentum attached to the SS loan projection. What I did is simply uh, take the SS loan uh, orthogonal matrix, throw away uh, four dimensions, and make a tetrahedron out of the four dimensional space you, you're left with. And if you do that, and then you take three orthogonal axes in the tetrahedron, this would be the px, py, and PZ, pz with respect to those orthogonal axes. So forget the details. I can give you all the details because I have it all explicitly written. But in any case, there is a recipe based on Elsa's loan to eventually attach a free momentum to each of the initial particles. After that, you have energy momentum conservation. So each particle you produce would have its own momentum and energy. Notice that if you add two momenta that are not in the same direction, that particle is going to get a mass immediately. OK? And so you would have a superposition also in mass. But consider that we are at the Big Bang. Why should a particle have a certain mass? There is no reason why there should be that. Not even intuitive reason. OK? When the universe cools down, then you might have a reason why you attach a mass to a particle, but definitely not at that type of energies. So it's interact. part of quantum mechanics and relativity. Sorry, sorry David. I was saying when you're highly interacting, you're always going to be in the flavor eigenstates and not the mass eigenstates. So it's yes. yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah, because you see, the mass gets produced every time you have an interaction, and the momentum is not in the same direction. So suppose you take two. Uh, massless particles which propagate in different directions, the particle that you produce would have, due to energy momentum conservation, a mass. So not only you, you end up with a field that expands uh, in the sense that it spreads in space and momentum, but also in mass so and energy. But that's quite natural if you think about it. But what is the reason for that kind of expansion? What is the force behind this? What is the? What is the force behind the expansion? You see, there is no force. It's, it's the universe itself. What is the force in a quantum mechanical model of a particle in a box? Just the walls. There's nothing else. The only thing I'm saying is that that box expands. I let it expand. So essentially, it's like a pressure that the particle makes in, on the walls. And that creates space. Why? Because the universe is expanding, and that's what you observed, what we observe. Theory. So that box is expanding. But there is no force. You see? But, but here, I think you are some, you're assuming some kind of breaking of symmetry. Because if it goes like this, there is also a perspective. It's a, it's a go, it can go in the opposite direction. Exactly. So okay. here you prefer one direction. Yeah. No, yeah. in each point, uh, you remember that, that point. When the particle is in some point with a certain amplitude, it always keeps two momentum. It's always superposition of two plane waves. This is what I showed you. So every time that particle has two momenta, is a superposition of two momenta. As I said, we don't think classically, we think quantum Isn't mechanics. it uh, so like a Casimir effect uh, with the walls when the space is very be. tiny? Well, I, didn't, I didn't think about that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I was just predicting that the quantity of fundamental particles in the universe would increase over time as the universe expands. Oh, yes, yeah. okay. gigantically. Yeah. I, I, I will show you, I will show you with, the, with the, of course, the number of fields is, is the number, in this model, is the number of the roots right. plus the cartons. It's going to be 248 right. fields, OK? Uh, but the number of uh, particles, quote unquote, so where that field is going to concentrate in certain points, that's going to be gigantic, by the way. And increasing. 
Oh, yes. Uh, this is the same calculation with the Moody pattern pro uh, projection. So again, the Moody pattern projection is a, is a way, both of them, in, uh, of course, exploit the icosians. And uh, it's a way of projecting on a four dimensional space. I like very much a Moody pattern, so I'm going to like very much what Ray uh, is constructing, which is very much, as you know, for what you said, me, you told me yesterday, is very much related to the Moody pattern uh, more, construction. Yes, so, yes. Um, so you project again on a four dimensional space, then you take a tetrahedron by taking the differences of the vectors that you get in that four dimensional space. So essentially, it's like the, 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 the space formed by the roots of an A3 or a D3. Uh, I will come back to this point, probably. Oh, this uh, I already said. Uh, this is the explicit construction. Okay, this, is, this relates to, to the roots, the ways that they are normally written. So normally, th this K1 is simply 1 in the first position and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So it's an orthonormal base, okay? So K1 is 1 and all zeros. So normally, the roots, like the one you have on your computer, Normally, they're chosen to be the first one is K1 minus K2, the second one is K2 minus K3, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you, if you check those, these are all, this, is, this, is, this forms a Dinkin diagram. So you can select those to be uh, the simple roots. And thinking in terms of the orthogonal subgroup, so as I told you yesterday, uh, uh, E8 is actually D8, the orthogonal SO16, say, plus its spinner, its file spinner, okay? That's E8, okay? And so you see, if you associate fermions to the spinners, you see that you start with all fermionic roots. The ninth one, the negative one that we add to that, we can pick it as the lowest height root. The lowest height root for E8 is this one. It's this combination of the simple roots. You can easily check. And it is, in terms of the Ks, is written in this way. So this is the ninth root. This is a negative root. And with those, you can build up of the roots. In terms of uh, the A2s, I started with, with the color meaning and with the flavor meaning attached to uh, two of those A2s, you would have in the start, a quark, a quark, a quark, a quark, a quark, a lepton, a lepton, dark matter, and a quark. Why dark matter? For a very simple, naive reason. I'm not an expert. <laughs> but simply because it has no charges, no color, no flavor charges. So let's call it dark matter. <laughs> what else? OK? Darker than that cannot be. <laughs> <laughs> so th th that's why this is alpha 8, doesn't have any color doesn't have any flavor according I repeat with the SU3 color and SU3 flavor that I picked up okay you can easily see that this has no charges so I call it dark matter and this will be the content of the first particles out of those and they're all fermions including the dark matter and and then you start interacting you 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 just you know turn the crankle you have all the recipe there they have uh, moment attached, energy because it's massless. You, you impose uh, energy momentum conservation. You have all the interactions with all the amplitudes. You have the amplitudes for the expansion because of that reasoning with the sine function. Uh, uh, so you have all the possible interferences occurring and everything is calculable. Now, if I still have, no minutes, no. No, nothing. Uh, the other thing is to go to gravitahedra, but I, I think I'll stop here. No way. It, it, it is interesting to see how permutahedra would so enter the more. picture and then the associahedra, but maybe, maybe we can talk. Maybe you can email this presentation to everybody or one of us, and then we'll email it to the rest so everybody Definitely. can then read these. Uh, yes. Yeah. Lines, I have it ready. So. It's not a paper. So forgive mistakes, no, no, misprints, no, and all these to, things. Send it to Fong, but, and Fong, you can distribute it to the rest yeah, of I it. actually have, it's, it's a, uh, a 52 many, pages notes that uh, I have, <laughs> in which all these things are, are explicit. Also, the SS law construction is explicit, everything is explicit. So I can, I can end it to you, but I only ask you not to, 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 to spread it, because uh, 
it's not a paper. It's, it has to be checked. It has to, no. But I can definitely give it to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.